We are athletes, okay? We are athletes. We're not gladiators. This isn't the Roman Coliseum. Give us one heartbeat. Give us one heartbeat tonight. We pray for protection for our team today. We pray for protection for our opponent. We ask for your intensity. We ask for one of focused intensity in your name. We pray it It's the third game of the preseason. Like a book. We played them the third game. Everybody played three quarters. The Bears are who we thought they were. Nebraska coach Frank Zolich says he's reviewing an ugly incident caught on tape after Saturday's loss to Missouri. Cornhuskers Kellen Houston is seen knocking down a Mizzou fan when the two crossed paths on the field in Columbia. Houston ran out toward the locker room while Tigers quarterback Brad Smith helped the fan up off the turf. You basketball fan, you got a favorite Laker? I love Kobe Bryant because I want him to have sex with me. Woo! Oh my gosh, let's go back. Y'all know I don't stretch. So if everybody asking why 84 ain't stretching, y'all know I don't stretch. Anybody pay attention to Viking football? 84 don't stretch on game day. I come ready. I came out the room, I was ready. Tell her, mama, you know I was ready. That's why you had me. Really hated each other bad. You knew when they got in there, somebody was getting knocked out. Hello, my name is Andre Lafayne Battles, and uh, I'm here today to share my testimony with you. Um, I don't know exactly why you came here. You might have came to the website to see what's going on, but obviously we have testimonies here. Our brother Lionel Mosby and his team, they're doing a wonderful job. And when the opportunity came up to me to share my testimony when he asked me, you know, I immediately felt that it was the will of the Lord to share. Uh, my story because we do know that uh, our testimonies help to encourage everyone else that may have struggled in the same lines of life that we have uh, because at the end of a testimony really is the result of God coming and taking over your life well I was born in Dallas Texas in 1983 uh, January 16th of 1983 uh, to Lafayne and Caffey Battles uh, it was an interesting uh, situation there. My mother was born and raised in Nassau, Bahamas. My father, he was born in Nebraska, but was raised in Texas. And so I guess you could say uh, I had a colorful background. My parents are both from different walks of life. And because of this, you know, because my mother was from the Bahamas, there were times in my life where we would move to the Bahamas and we would stay there for periods of time. Um, from a very early age, I knew that God had a plan for my life, and here's the reason why I knew that. My father and I did not have a relationship. As a matter of fact, uh, my father was verbally and physically abusive to me. Um, and it got to the point at certain times that it was so bad uh, that the police had to get involved. I remember at one particular time, we were living in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, my father he struck me down and I fell and I injured my back and my mother was just you know she was just really irate over the situation she called the police and they came and picked him up and I remember crying uh, because although my father did not treat me the way I expected a father to treat his son I still had much love for him and I didn't understand exactly why he you know would do the things that he did but like I said, when the police took him, I cried. And uh, I asked my mother, I said, you know, why is my dad doing these things to me? And I remember, I'll never forget it, I was nine years old at the time. She picked me up and put me on the bathroom sink or the bathroom counter and looked me in the face and she said, Andre, uh, I don't know why your father's treating you the way that he's doing, 
But God one day is going to use these experiences that you have for some purpose. Well, life continued. Um, like I said, my parents were very unstable. They were in a marriage that they both were having issues being committed to. And when I say being committed, uh, my father, you know, he did things that uh, was not good. He had affairs. He did different things like that. He introduced uh, different things into our lives, such as his alcoholic habit. Um, he was a drinker and he smoked. Um, but at that same year, around that same time, that I had this incident at the age of nine with my father in the physical abuse. I remember my mother or my dad, I can't remember exactly who, they told me to go to the vehicle um, and get something out of the back trunk. But when I went to the back trunk, the devil had already planned for this to happen. I didn't know. But when I opened the trunk, I found in a box some Playboy magazines in the back trunk of my father's car. And at the age of nine, you know, seeing those uh, explicit images, it really scarred my mind. Um, it was a lot for me. And obviously, of course, you know, because of the flesh, it was attractive. I didn't know exactly what I was looking at. But a certain feeling came over me as a result of looking at those magazines that particular day. And it began a train of possession in my life, meaning that the devil used pornography uh, to be a crutch for me for many, many years. Um, and you know, I, t I tell you, man, the life that we live, uh, we begin to learn quickly as we get older, as we mature, that there definitely has to be some spirit or some entity out there that's working against us. Um, and we begin to learn that very quickly. And like I said, with the pornography there, I definitely understood in times later that that was uh, the devil and his power against my life. Well, anyway, uh, we moved to the Bahamas shortly after this period. Like I'm the oldest of five. I'm the only boy. I have no brothers, but I have four sisters. And like I said, we moved to the Bahamas. Um, because of the, the situation between my dad and I, because of the relationship or the non-existent relationship, it caused me to look for love and attention, affection in the wrong places. Um, and if you're a father watching this video, I would advise you, please, especially if you have a son, spend time with your son. Uh, please, because uh, that son looks up to you. Regardless of whether or not your attitude or your influence upon that boy is positive or negative, he still looks up to you. Um, and he will seek to emulate your character. He will seek to copy what he sees in you. Um, and my father was a huge jazz fan. He loved jazz music. I remember we had a 1989 Lincoln Continental 5.0 engine uh, and we would drive this vehicle. Uh, matter of fact, uh, we had the vehicle uh, shipped from America to the Bahamas when we moved. And uh, we would, my dad and I, we would ride around the, the island and listen to all of his favorite jazz artists. And I fell in love with this music, um, but little did I know even at that time that that was another crutch that the devil was using because the very word jazz means sex. If you were to study that, it means in, uh, in its original form, ejaculation. Um, and it's another form of sex. And so the devil knew what he was doing. He was trying his best to keep me down with sexual sin. And I'll share some more about that as we go on, but we would listen to jazz all the time. We'd drive around, and that was the only time me and my dad ever really had any kind of connection um, when I was growing up was when we would listen to his favorite music riding around the city. Um, besides that, there were some dark days, and uh, I remember my father was a very uh, avid basketball fan. Um, as a matter of fact, he himself was a good basketball player. Um, he had aspirations as a young person to enter into the professional league. But you know, things happen and it never did work out for him that way. So of course, all of those dreams fell on my shoulders. I mean, as a, as a child, you know, you're not really trying to uh, live out your parents' dreams, so to speak. You're just trying to have fun. 
Well, it just so happened that in the Bahamas where we lived, we stayed with my mother's grandparents. And right across the street from where we stayed, there was a basketball court there. And so, of course, there was a place where I spent a lot of my time. And I remember one particular evening, I must have been 13. Uh, my dad came across the street to watch me and some of the neighborhood boys play. And immediately I felt a spirit come over me. I was not happy about him coming because I knew that he would critique me and criticize me in the way that I was playing. And sure enough, you know, he came over there and we were just playing a pickup game. Um, he came on the court and he seeked to embarrass me. Um, and he, I remember, I'll never forget it. Uh, I took a basketball, I took the ball and I, I tried to make a particular shot and I missed. And in front of all the neighborhood guys, younger guys, some were older, he cussed me. I mean, you goofy, blank, 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 blank. And immediately these kids burst out in laughter. Um, and they weren't laughing with me, they were laughing at me. And it hurt because not only was I receiving criticism, but it hurt more because I was receiving it from my father in front of strangers, basically. And it, I never forgot that, that, that situation, I never forgot that incident. And you know, from that point, I sought really to hate my father because I felt like, well, you know, he hated me. You know, and I couldn't understand why. But anyway, growing up wasn't easy because we moved back and forth between the Bahamas and America. So often we were always uprooted. Just as my feet were getting firmly planted on one particular place or in one particular area, my folks would snatch us up, uh, all five of us, me and my sisters included, and we would have to move somewhere else. And this was emotionally, uh, this was definitely emotionally hard on us because as kids you know you want a stable environment that you can grow and mature and develop in correctly but we did not have this luxury I remember uh, attending the academy there it was a it was a Christian Academy there in the Bahamas that I attended but because there was so much emotional stress and drama in my life I could not focus properly on my schoolwork mind you I was not a dumb child uh, my mother made me read. I remember her uh, giving me uh, book reports to do. I would have to read books and give her a report as to what I read. And so that started a love interest for books. But at the same time, I was never able to focus my attention on studying hard enough to make the grades in school. Um, and so I received a lot of criticism and ridicule, uh, even at the academy, the Christian school that I attended. So I quickly became or began to, to receive the, uh, the label of being a bad boy because, hey, you know, when, you, when you're not recognized for good things, you want to be recognized for something, so you turn to the bad. And, you know, I definitely became rebellious and uh, there were a lot of times in school where I was expelled because of my behavior, uh, getting into fights, um, bringing firecrackers to school and setting them off in the gym. You know, just different rebellious things that I would do because there was a void in my life. I was looking for attention. If I had only known then what I know now, and that is that God had a specific plan for my life, even during the chaotic moments that I experienced early on. If I only knew, if I had only known that then, then it would have changed a lot of the course of my life. But anyway, as life continued, the pornography that started to grow. I remember uh, my grandparents had an old-fashioned satellite dish in the back of their yard. Um, and so we were able to pick up, if any of you were viewing remember the old satellite dishes, you can pick up almost anything on those things. Um, from sports channels, uh, movie channels, you name it. And I remember flipping through the, through the, uh, the stations one day unsupervised. And parents, man, if you, if you have children, please do not allow your children to be unsupervised watching the television and things of that nature because it's definitely dangerous. If you're not there to watch your kids and see what it is that they're viewing, then that is an opportunity for the enemy to creep in. And so anyway, I'm watching and flipping through the channels and I come across the Playboy channel. Now, whereas I saw images on a book of sexual activity, this now is the actual interaction or the intercourse being taking place in front of me 
And this really left a heavy influence on my mind, which began a habit of masturbation, even at a young age. Um, I found myself pleasuring myself um, as a result of watching these things. And I would always feel, even at a young age, not really knowing that it was wrong per se, I would always feel guilty afterwards. I would always feel that I was doing something that deep inside I knew was wrong. But I had no power in and of myself to change. And so, continuing the story, you know, I remember uh, I had a best friend in, in school at the academy. His name was Diavid. And because, mainly because, you know, he and I both were somewhat rebellious, we, we both weren't excellent in school in terms of our grades, our friendship grew and we became really close friends. Um, I remember one particular time he got into a fight uh, with an upperclassman, and this fight was so brutal. The upperclassman that he was fighting got a hold of an umbrella, took the umbrella and went at my friend directly towards his face and stabbed him not even an inch under his eye. Had that umbrella not been guided by the hand of God, my best friend would have lost his eye. He'd be walking around today with one eye. But the grace and mercy of God stopped that umbrella from injuring him in such a way. And I remember that. I mean, I, like I said, I was in the ninth grade at this time. And I remember saying, wow, you know, that could, that could have definitely ended differently. And that kind of started in my heart, you know, a, a, a desire to really want to get away from certain negative things that I was doing. But like I said, um, I did not have the power within myself to do it. I remember at that time I tried my first cigarette. Um, there was a lady that uh, in the neighborhood that we lived in, she was trying to build a house. And as she was building the house, she was also living in the house and putting the house together piece by piece. And she would sell different things out of her home in order to support the building of her home. And one of those things she would sell was cigarettes. She would sell them out of the pack. Knowing that I was a child, she still would sell cigarettes to me and other neighborhood kids just so that she could maintain or uh, provide money for her to build this home. And, you know, thinking back on that, I realized how bad that was. But, hey, you know, when we don't know God, we do things and uh, we, we, just, we just live life. We go through the motions. Uh, we don't really understand why it is that we do certain things. And even as adults, some of us, and for this lady in particular, we just get so used to sin. You know, sin has a way of entangling us, uh, causing us not to be able to see the danger that we either place ourselves in or place other individuals in. And so, yeah, I tried my first cigarette as a result of that. And I remember calling uh, one of my aunts. I was always able to call her and speak to her about things that were burdening me. And I remember calling her and telling her, well, hey, you know, I, I just smoked my first cigarette. And she didn't get down on me. You know, she didn't, she didn't react in a way that I thought she would. Uh, she said, you know, Andre, that's not the best thing for you. You know that that can harm you, that that can kill you. Uh, and she encouraged me not to do it, but she did not. You know how some parents can get real hard on you, cuss you, uh, want to beat you, etc., etc. No, she, she just said, look, don't do that again. And by God's grace, it was many, many, many years on down the road that I did actually try another cigarette. Well, anyway... Uh, my grades were poor in school. The only class that I was ever good in was religion. There was something about the Bible I just loved. I mean, even as a child, I loved the Bible stories. I loved to read the stories about Samson and how his strength enabled him to rip a lion piece to piece that attacked him. I loved to read stories on Moses, who was one of my favorite Bible characters, and how he was able to lead a group of people all the way from Egypt to the Promised Land and all of the stories that took place in between. I loved the Bible. I loved stories and that was the only class in school that I was able to receive good passing grades in. Everything else I failed. I mean, if, if science, mathematics, English, grammar, it, and like I said before, it wasn't because I was dumb. It wasn't because I did not have the understanding to do these things. It just was a result of such the emotional stress that I was coming up under. 
Well, eventually, my folks decided that they were going to move back to the U.S. And at this time, I decided that I wasn't leaving. You know, I was like, you know what, I'm tired of moving. We've moved from the U.S. to the Bahamas and back to, to the U.S. so many times. I'm staying put. I'm staying here with my grandparents. And so for a time, my folks consented to that. They left, uh, my dad, my mom, and my four sisters, and they moved up to uh, the Dallas, Texas area. And I stayed in the Bahamas with my grandparents. And at that time, I really began to become brave in my rebellion. I remember my grandmother had, and see, to this day, I was 15 at this particular time, and to this day, my grandmother still drives the same car. It was a Volkswagen Jetta. And I remember a cousin of mine that lived around the corner from me and a few of our friends, we decided that we were going to steal the car and go around and ride around the city. Uh, my grandmother and uh, my grandfather had left the house. They were on errands and they were riding with other people. They left the keys to the vehicle there. Um, and I found them and my friends and I jumped in the car. Of course, I drove and we drove around the city and I just began to become bold. I, was, I had a girlfriend. You know, I was uh, beginning to indulge in different things in terms of uh, sexual activity with the opposite sex. So I was beginning to quickly go down a dark path. And my mother, realizing that, you know what, my son needs to be with me, needs to be raised with me under my roof. I remember one day she called me. And I answered the phone. I said, hello. Didn't know who it was. I just answered the house phone. And immediately my mother said, who are you having sex with? <laughs> and it just blew me out of the water. I was like, huh? And I said, nobody, which was true. At that particular time, I was not sexually active, although I was doing other things. But it startled me. And uh, she said, you know what? You're my son. You're my child. You are coming to live with me. And so about a month or so later, sure enough, I found myself on a plane flying back to the U.S. to live with my parents. And I was upset. I did not want to do it. Uh, because not only was I tired of having my roots uprooted out of the ground and moved around, I didn't want to be around my dad. Um, and obviously my father and mother were still together. And so I got to the Dallas, Texas area. And uh, from a very, let me backtrack here just a bit. I knew that, like I said before, God had a purpose for my life. What I didn't know was that the enemy, because I was not really aware of Satan and how he works at that time, I did not know that he had a plan for me also, and that plan evolved or involved death. When I was 14, I was diagnosed with diabetes. I woke up one morning, and I could not see in anything within two or three feet in front of me. I mean, it was just, my vision was blurred. I couldn't see. I remember having other symptoms like frequent urination. Uh, I was always thirsty. And, you know, of course, at that time, I didn't really know what was going on. But once I realized that morning I woke up and couldn't see, I thought I just needed glasses. My grandmother took me to the hospital because at this particular time, I was still in the Bahamas. And I went and we checked my eyes. And the doctor said, well, yeah, you definitely need glasses. But the wisdom of the Lord was placed upon this woman's mind, this doctor, and she said, before I prescribe you some glasses, how about we have you go to the clinic and they do a, uh, a blood sugar test on you to make sure your blood sugar is not too high. Because of course she knew that this was one of the symptoms. Sure enough, my blood sugar was 700 plus over what it should have been. Um, as a matter of fact, a normal blood sugar, uh, for the listening audience that may be familiar, Normal blood sugar levels are between 75 units and 125 units. Mine was 700 plus. So the devil was trying at that time to kill me. And had I not went to the hospital at that point, I might have slipped into a diabetic coma and I could very well have died at the age of 14. God has been so good to me. And I have to say that no matter what you go through, uh, no matter what experiences um, you've been made to go through and endure God still has a plan for your life and, You know the Bible says that behold I've known you I've formed you within your mother's womb and even before that moment I knew you and had a plan for you and was able to give you something better Than what it is that you will find as you go through your life 
But I didn't know that, you know, and, and many times we don't know these things early on. So I moved to the Texas uh, with my parents, regrettably. But of course, the enemy followed. He never wants to leave us alone. Uh, and I became an avid football freak. Um, I was, at this time, mind you, I was in the 10th grade when I moved to the moved to Texas, rather, um, which put me at about 16, and I was nearly 300 pounds in the six uh, uh, in the 10th grade, rather, uh, six foot two, 300 pounds. And when I went to the school, remember my sisters were already had already came before me, and so when I got there, I was trying to make my way around and. And, and make myself comfortable. I remember one of the coaches ran into me, one of the uh, football coaches. He said, excuse me, sir, are you looking for your kids? That's how big I was. He thought I was an adult. And I said, no, I'm not looking for my kids. I'm a student here. He grabbed me by the shoulder and drug me to the, uh, to the locker rooms, uh, the coaching staff area, and he signed me up for football right there. I, coming from the Bahamas, we don't play the traditional NFL type football, you know, we didn't play those kind of games, really. Um, so I wasn't really familiar with football. But because of the attention that I was getting, um, because not only were the coaches uh, elated over my size and the ability, the potential of my ability, uh, I was receiving attention from some of the ladies. And of course, as a young man, uh, that's what you want. You know, you want to be uh, looked upon as uh, unique. Uh, for whatever talents you might possess. So anyway, um, I remember getting signed up for football, and I did pretty good. They put me on the defensive end side of the football. I was a, a defensive end, and uh, basically the coaches said, look, if you don't understand anything, just go after the person with the football. And my very first play, I will never forget it, my very first play in cleats, I sacked the quarterback, and I felt good. The crowd was cheering, and... I mean, I just felt like, okay, yeah, this is going to be something that I can find a niche. Because mind you, when you grow up with negative atmospheres, you grow up with uh, a broken relationship with your, with your parents, you tend to want to find something that you can focus your energy on. And so once I felt a bit of success from this, I immediately began to focus my attention on it. Uh, the girls, like I said, began to come around because of the ability, the physical ability, um, and I began to like that. I uh, began to uh, acquire friends. People who I knew wouldn't really bother with me had I not been talented, so to speak. Um, but yet, because I liked the attention and because I felt a part of the in crowd, I went along with it. I was invited to things and I was, I was given opportunities that I probably would not have gotten um, had I not been a football player. Um, and, you know, looking at back at that time, you know, I realized that uh, whenever we seek to use talents or abilities to elevate ourselves, yeah, it may feel good for a time, but really, in, in reality, our abilities and our talents sometimes cause us to overlook who we truly are and cause us to sweep our issues under the rug and deal with them maybe at a later time. Because we're getting the, the attention of the crowd, we're getting the attention of the people, because we're looked upon as great or talented, it helps us to think that we're better than we are and so we never deal with our issues. Um, and that was me. We got, I was chosen to go and play, um, we were chosen All-American team to go and play uh, in Disney World um, in Florida. They have a complex there called the Disney World Wide Worlds of Sports Complex. And we went out there, the year was 1998. In high school, I was in the 10th grade. I got a chance to go out there and play. And you know, we had fun. And, and, and you know, growing up in the church, which I forgot to mention, yes, I did grow up Seventh-day Adventist. I grew up a Christian. And when I say that, not that I myself had a personal relationship with God. I grew up knowing of God. I, knew, I grew up with parents that uh, made sure that we at least attended church. But at the same time, I myself did not have a personal relationship. And as a Seventh-day Adventist, for those of you that don't know, we believe in the fourth commandment, which says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor, do all thy work. But the seventh day, which is Saturday, 
is the, uh, is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, and in it thou shalt not do any work. But when I was playing sports, we played on Friday nights. Um, and biblically, the next day begins when the sun sets on the previous day. And I was playing football on Friday nights, um, and when I went to Disney World, we had to play several games, and they were all on the Sabbath, on Saturday. Um, and at that time, it didn't bother me any, because it felt like to me, well, this is going to be my future. But you know, the Lord has a way of turning you around. And uh, I remember, uh, once I got back to the U.S., or rather, once I got back to Texas from the uh, Florida trip, um, we were playing a particular game against a school, and they have this maneuver in football where the offensive player does what we call a chop block, where they go towards your knee uh, so that they can stop your forward progress as a defensive player. And I remember this individual went down and he did a chop block maneuver on my knee, and it hurt my knee so badly, my knee was swollen, I was not able to walk properly. I don't think I broke anything, but I really... After that experience, it, it, it caused me to realize, you know what, this is a full contact sport. And although, yes, I was involved in hurting other individuals in terms of going after the individual with the ball and bringing them to the ground, I never had experienced prior to that moment any physical pain from something, you know, from the outside force on the field. And it really made me think about what I really wanted to do because, I mean, not that I was soft or that I was weak. But I couldn't imagine myself playing this game throughout the rest of my high school career, playing it in four years of college, and then going possibly, if it ever went that far, to the professional leagues and playing it for 10, 15, maybe years. I couldn't imagine going through that kind of pain. So that changed a lot of my mindset and caused me to ponder, you know, well, this might not be it. You know, I had those thoughts. And so as a result of that, that was my last season playing football um, and I gave it up willingly you know nobody forced me uh, I just said you know what this is not it um, I'm not I'm not gonna pursue this any longer well um, of course the devil always wants to occupy our times you know there's a saying that says an idle mind is the devil's workshop which basically means when you don't have anything to do when you don't have scheduled activity when you don't have things planned and you're just sitting around that's when you, your mind is open to the suggestions of the enemy. Um, and this was me around the time when I stopped playing sports. Um, we were still living in Texas. But what ended up happening, my father got an opportunity, uh, my, both my mother and father got an opportunity to move to Florida with their job. And so we decided uh, as a family that we would do that. And when I moved to Florida at this particular time, I was 17 years old. I was just coming into myself, you know, I was beginning to mature physically, I was beginning to mature mentally, um, I was shedding a lot of that baby fat, because like I said, I was 300 pounds uh, in the 10th grade, and I was beginning to level out, you know, um, and women started noticing, girls started noticing that. Uh, when we moved to Florida, I'll never forget it, I was 17, like I said, and a young lady was in town that particular summer. Uh, whose sister lived there in that particular town uh, where we were living in Florida and she visited our church she would go to the church there and I wasn't interested in her she was an older girl she had a baby who was no older than three months so at 17 I wasn't focusing my attention on a woman like that but the devil has little subtle ways of bringing us closer to what he wants us to do when we're not connected to God and as a result, I love children. I love to hold babies. I love to play with children. And an innocent time, I just asked her, well, hey, can I hold your baby? And she said, yes. Not knowing in my mind, of course, what was going on and taking place with her, that she was beginning to look at me as a suitor, uh, you know, as someone that would come in and help her with this child and, and, and possibly be a husband. Um, I wasn't thinking that far, of course, at 17. But I always had a genuine heart. I, I, I would always feel sorry for people because of the situations I grew up in. And I began to look at her not just as, you know, a, a, a woman, but I began to look at her as someone that maybe, you know, needed help. I began to look at her as, as, as a situation where maybe if I can give her some of my time and affection, I can help her out in some way. Still not thinking 
uh, in the terms of relationship wise, but I wanted to help her. Well, she saw that and she immediately jumped on that. And I remember uh, as a result sharing some of my first sexual uh, relationships with this girl. I immediately fell in lust. You notice I didn't say love because love is a mature thing. Love is a mature action. It's a mature thought. But I immediately fell in lust because of, number one, she was older. She was well and fully developed. Um, and so she had a lot to offer in the area of sexual pleasure. And I began to uh, sneak out of the house to visit her because my parents did not approve. She was three years my senior and with a child, so they knew that she was a bit forward. But because my feelings began to become invested in her, um, I began to defy the laws of my parents and I began to go and sneak out. I had a friend, uh, he was a trusted young man in the church. My parents enjoyed him. All of the members of the church trusted his opinion and trusted his, uh, his judgment. I set up one night for him to call my parents and ask if I could go out with him to the bowling alley, which they consented. They said yes, um, but they didn't know was that after he picked me up, we went and picked up my lady friend, and we went to the bowling alley, um, and uh, we had it all set up. You know, he had a double date, or it was a double date. He had a date. I had a date, of course. We play, went and played, uh, you know, at the bowling alley and everything. Um, and after that, because we were living in Florida, we were living off, you know, near the, the beach, we drove around the beach area. And I remember, uh, I have a vivid memory, and I remember there was this song that came on, um, and basically the words were saying, see at the time, this young lady was living in New York. She was only in Florida on vacation uh, to visit her sister when we met. And it was coming close to the time where she was about to leave and return to, to uh, New York. And a song came on the radio and the words went a little something like this, if ever you're in my arms again, this time I'll love you forever. And the devil planned it, had it all set up, man. And you know, I'm falling more and more in lust with her. And you know, we're doing things in the back seat of this person's vehicle that we should have not been doing. And I say that because young people, when you don't know, first of all, who you are, how on earth can you feel comfortable mentally with getting involved with the opposite sex sexually. I mean, yeah, it may feel good, but you have to understand or you have to even have a conscience to know that something here is not right. I don't know myself well enough. I Normally you don't even know the person well enough that you're involved with, and I didn't, I barely knew this woman. Well, it just so happened I had a job at that time. I was part-time work at Taco Bell. I was 17, like I said, we're living in Pompano Beach, Florida. Um, Deerfield Beach, Florida, which is near Pompano Beach, mind you. And um, I was working at Taco Bell there. And um, I ended up, it was the last day that she would be in town. And I had no way of visiting her. My parents definitely wouldn't take me to go see her because they didn't want us together. Um, and I just gotten my, my feeble little paycheck, you know, part-time worker, 17. I'm not getting paid anything. I think my check might have been $150 that week. And uh, I had to desperately make sure I saw her this one last time because in my mind, I was planning on having sex with her before she left. So I lied to my folks. I told them that I had to go to work. I drove, I rode my bicycle to work because I didn't live too far from where I worked. And I parked my bicycle outside the back of the store, the Taco Bell restaurant, and I called a cab. And mind you, this girl, the, the lady that was involved with at this time, she was living, oh man, 15, 20 miles away, and cabs are not cheap. It cost me $100 round trip, basically, just to go and see this girl. And like I said, the devil had it planned because I got in the, the cab, and the individual in the cab, the cab driver, asked me questions, hey, where you going? And I, you know, was willing to give him the information, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to visit my girlfriend, she's moving back to New York. I just want to see her last time. This guy goes in the glove compartment and pulls out some condoms and throws them to me. He's like, here, you're going to need these. The devil had it set up. I got there, um, and I remember feeling real afraid because I was a virgin, you know, at 17, and I'm not ashamed to say that. You know, a lot of times young people feel as if the earlier you lose your virginity, the better. But really, the earlier you lose your virginity, the harder, the harder it will become for you to become mended later on in life. 
please, if you're a virgin listening to this, it doesn't matter if you're 30, if you're a virgin and you're not married, wait until you get that special person sent into your life by the Lord. Well, anyway, I got to the house and um, it was a weird situation, maybe because she kind of felt what I was looking for. And in her heart, it seemed as if she wanted to give it. But there were so many other things that were taking place that I found out later uh, as to why we never did go all the way that particular day. And I remember feeling dejected, you know, feeling like I spent all this money to catch a cab to come and see you, and I didn't get what I expected to receive. Well, anyway, she moved back to New York. This was the year 2000. And of course, you know, around this time, the Y2K scare was right around the corner. Everybody was worried about that. And, you know, Christmas time was coming. She had just moved back. And, uh, you know, what ended up happening Christmas morning, December 25th of the year 2000, I called her bright and early to wish her Merry Christmas. And when I called, a gentleman answered the phone. Hello, hello. And I said, I said, huh? You know, I, I knew something was strange. And I said, excuse me, I said, can I speak to so-and-so? And, -so? and uh, he said, hold on. And sure enough, she came to the phone. She said, Andre, it's too early. And click, hung up the phone. Now, we had family living in Orlando, Florida. We were near Miami, like I said, in Deerfield Beach area, about 30 miles north of Miami. Orlando, Florida is a three and a half hour drive from that area and to there and back. And that particular Christmas, we were spending our time with that particular family in Orlando. The entire three and a half hour drive there, the entire time we were there, and the three and a half hour drive back, I was in just a despondent mode. Because I just knew that it was some man in that house. Like I said, I called early. Why would there be someone there that early? I had a feeling that this person had to have spent the night there. And so my, my heart just sank in, because mind you, I was sending this girl money, I was buying her, 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 her son clothes and mailing it to them. My little feeble checks, like I said, $150 every two weeks, I was spending all my money on this girl. See, the devil knew that when he planted that seed of sexual sin in my heart through pornography, he knew that it would fill some type of a void. Now, it was not a, the type of filling uh, that we can deem as good. What we would call it is an empty calorie, so to speak. It was something that was definitely detrimental to my spiritual, even my physical health. But the devil knew that as a result of the pornography, that it would cause an emotional tie to sexual things and to the opposite sex. And because of the relationship that I had with my dad and the injuries that had taken place there, you know, I was very, very sensitive and open to rejection, even by the opposite sex. And so, as a result of this taking place and this gentleman answering the phone, you know, everything in my life just seemed to crash because my whole life at that time was her. Um, needless to say, you know, uh, the relationship went south from there, and I learned a very difficult lesson as a result of that. But I continued to grow, um, I, I continued to mature. And around this time, the new year was coming in, the year 2001 had just rolled in. Mind you, we had just moved to Florida at the end of the year 1999, Christmas of 99. We settled in into Florida very early on that year 2000. And by the end of the year 2000, the beginning of the 2001 era, we were already moving back to Texas. Oh man, it was, it was, it was definitely... Uh, a struggle uh, and this time my grandfather my dad's father uh, was the one I guess you can say that I blame for it he had a business a construction business and he wanted my father to come and help him uh, as an assistant manager so he drove his trailer all the way from Texas to Florida and packed all of our belongings and drove us on out of there into Texas Man, it was tough uh, because, like I said, growing up and it's still at this time, still living with my parents, we moved around so much. Um, so when we moved to, to back to Texas, I was determined, you know what? I'm not getting back into high school. I'm going to get my GD and I'm going off to college. Now, remember when I was nine, I told you, my mother sat me down and told me and looked me in the face and said that God has a plan for your life. And although at that time I could not understand it, I was beginning as a result of the 
circumstances that I had been through with my dad, the negative relationship with this young lady that I just mentioned, and just different things in the sports, I started beginning to feel the pull of God on my heart to become a minister. When I was, I remember one particular time we were in Atlanta, we had already moved from there, we were on vacation back in that area, and it was during the Summer Olympics of 1996, so I'll never forget it, um, which the Olympics were hosted in Atlanta, Georgia that particular year. Um, I went to sleep that night. We were in a hotel room, my folks and everyone, and I uh, went to sleep. And immediately I was woke, awoken by my dad. He shook, shook me real violently and said, wake up, wake up. And I woke up and I, and I asked him, I said, what's, what's the deal? Why are you waking me up? He's like, because you look like something's going on with you. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, you were just all over the ground rolling and rocking in your sleep, screaming to the top of your lungs that you wanted to be a minister. I want to be a minister. I want to be a minister. Now, of course, I don't remember that because I was sleeping. But when they told me this story, it just kind of, it was interesting. It just kind of made me think like, wow, I guess maybe I was dreaming about preaching. You know, so the Lord was still bringing me back to that foundation of Him having a purpose for my life, regardless of the negative that was there. So anyway, I got my GED, I was just about to be 18, and I determined that I was going to go to college to study theology. Uh, the Lord opened doors, or at least it appeared that He began to open doors, and uh, I was able to attend college, not very far from where my folks were currently living at that time. Um, and I, like I said, I entered to become a minister, I began to study religion. Um, and at the age of 18, I did not know God either. It was no real different in my spiritual life at 18 than it was at 6, 7, 8, or 9. I was just a little older and really more rebellious because at that time, now I'm away in school. I have no parents above me to tell me when to go to bed, when to get up. There's no one there to direct me, to tell me how to live my life, how to spend my time. And in college, it's not like high school where they make you do your schoolwork. Hey, you're paying for your education now. So if you don't do your schoolwork, they're not going to hassle you about it. It's on you. And so at that time, it just became a big party for me. Um, I, did, I was not focused at all. I remember uh, getting involved in another relationship. And this particular young lady was a Puerto Rican girl, beautiful on the outside. And when I say on the outside, I emphasize that because many times that's all we're looking for. Uh, we're not really looking for a person that can help us spiritually, emotionally. We're not looking for someone that is a spiritual person. We're only looking for an outer shell that can make our flesh be satisfied. And she was beautiful. Uh, I remember other guys on campus couldn't believe that Andre Dre got this girl. You know, and I guess maybe because she was a bit out of my league, but I was very determined. Um, she didn't like me at first. Uh, there was no interest on her part in me. But I would not give up, and three months of, of courting or pursuing her, she finally consented to be my girlfriend. And of course, I felt on top of the world. You know, I felt like, yeah, man, I got the prize. All the other fellas wanted this girl, and I got her. You know, so of course, there was some pride there. But really, the only thing that that helped me accomplish was the furthering away from my Lord and Savior. I didn't know Him to begin with, but that relationship took me down a dark road. See, my mother, although my relationship with my father was hard and it was non-existent, my mother tried her level-hearted best to teach her children, and especially me, her only son, how to love God. She would make sure we had devotions in the home at times. She would make sure that we knew our duty to the Lord. She would try to instruct us on how to live. Uh, but of course, when those things are not important in your mind, you can hear them through one ear and it'll go out the next. But God promises that if we teach our children at a young age, although they may depart from that knowledge, the knowledge will not depart from them. And so I thank God that my mother tried. Uh, and she gave me that information that I needed on how to get to know God. So when I got to school, to college in the year 2001, and I met this young woman, I, at that point, had learned certain things about the entertainment industry. My mother had showed and shared with us, you know, secular music, how it was wrong, and how different uh, movies 
and different things of entertainment are harmful. But when I met this young woman, I mean all of the things that I learned to stay away from, she enjoyed and loved heavily. And we began to become avid movie goers. I mean every time we wanted something to do, the idea would come up to go and see a movie. And almost every movie that came out during the year 2001, 2 and 3 when I was in a relationship with this young lady, we saw together. Um, I remember starting to even my diet would change because I was raised in a home or rather my, my grandparents uh, tried to teach us about healthy eating. But of course as a result of being in the mix or being in the influence or under the influence of people that are not trying to live right, I began to adapt or adopt those lifestyle habits and my diet became, became bad. Um, my lifestyle became bad. Um, everything about me began to go down and this young man that was had initially decided to go to school to work for the Lord uh, got away from that. Um, God has a way of speaking to our hearts and our minds even when we don't want to hear His voice. Uh, many times we will throw things in our hearts uh, and what I mean by that is we'll listen to certain music, we'll watch certain things to drown out the spirit, to drown out the conviction that what we're doing is wrong. But the louder the entertainment gets, the louder or the faster we run away from God, the faster He runs in pursuit of us. Um, and the relationship with this young lady began to go south. I remember after only three short semesters in college, I ended up dropping out of school because I couldn't afford it. My grades weren't good enough for scholarships. Because mind you, like I said, I wasn't focused on my schoolwork, uh, so I had to drop out. And that was the beginning of the end for my relationship with this young lady. So much of my heart and affection was into her as it was with the former young woman that it almost seemed impossible for life to go on after this relationship ended. Um, it was hard. We were dating for almost two and a half, three years. Um, and I just knew that she would be my wife. I mean, I had made plans. Um, it's, it, at the school where I was attending in college, uh, they called upon me to do certain things like preach and uh, run the press service. And I would be proud to showcase this woman on my side. I'd be sh proud to show her off. I just knew that she would be my wife. But as a result of just different things taking place in our relationship, uh, we began to drift uh, away from each other. And the relationship ended and it was very, very difficult for me. And, and, and I just cannot help but emphasize to you again, um, before you enter a relationship, please know first and foremost who you are. Because a lot of times we go and get involved in these relationships looking for someone on the outside of us to complete us. When the only thing that can complete you is your relationship with God. That is the only thing uh, that will give you peace. Um, and so the relationship ended and in the year 2003, I found myself at home, no college degree, no girlfriend, no friends, because mind you, all of the friends that I had accumulated in school were merely acquaintances. They were not truly friends. A friend is someone that sticks close. The Bible says that Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Well, the type of friends that I had, they were really not friends at all. Uh, when I left school, I didn't hear from them. They never called me. They never checked up on me. They never came to visit me. Even in my pursuit of wanting to still be around them, I would go up there on weekends at times and visit. When I would visit my girlfriend, my ex-girlfriend at the time, and visit some other, other people, they would give me the cold shoulder. It wasn't the same. Uh, we have to understand that we live in a selfish world. And when people, when people have selfish motives, when people are not willing to let you into their cliques, they will do really any and everything to hurt you. Well, like I said, in the year 2003, I found myself back home, no college degree, no girlfriend, no friends. I was completely devoid of any comfort that I was receiving or indulging in in the world. Um, and it was a very dark point in my life. Uh, this time I was 19, going on 20. And that is really where I began to drift even further into sin, a lifestyle that I knew was wrong. Uh, at that time, uh, because I was so hurt and rejected over the relationship that had ended with my girlfriend in college, 
um, I became rebellious. Um, I would openly defy God. And what I mean, I would talk against God. Um, I would rebuke God even, I guess, if there's such a thing. Um, and how foolish of someone to think uh, that they could rebuke God or that they could be angry with God when God has the power uh, to do away with you if he so chose by just a thought. Uh, who am I? You know, what, what, what could I do to harm God? But anyway, I was so angry um, with the world and with the circumstances that I would found myself in. Many times we fail to look at ourselves as the cause of the problem and the issue and we try to blame everything else on the outside and that was what I was doing. Um, when I moved back home my parents were very disappointed in me. My mother especially because you remember at nine she told me God had a plan for me and when I went to college at 18 she felt that that plan was actually beginning to start. Well when I ended up back home out of college with no degree and no plans for the future she was upset and it began to cause a strife, a rift between my mother and I to the point where we began to argue verbally. We'd go back and forth um, to the point where one night I remember I imagine a young man in college studying to be a, a pastor now working at McDonald's and I remember getting home late one night because after work I went over to a friend's house we watched a movie. You know we fill our time with a lot of things that we feel can comfort us when really in, 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 in reality it doesn't. And I got home late, and my mother was waiting up for me. And uh, she, we got into an argument again. It got so heated that I took my television and threw it across the room. And she called the police. The police said, look, son, you're above the age of 18. You have the rights to leave. Because if we do have to come back, somebody's going to jail. And most likely it's going to be you. And so I called some people that I knew that I, had, I could stay with until I got myself on my feet, and I moved out. Uh, which began negative things in my life. I began to start drinking alcohol and, and up to that point I had never done that. Um, remember like I said at the age of 13 or so I had had my first cigarette but I, that was it. I never did do it again but as a result of some of the things that were taking place I got back into that habit started smoking cigarettes again and uh, lost my virginity around this time. Um, all because I was drifting so far and so so far away from the Lord. Um, the devil had it all planned. I remember just feeling so low that I didn't care how I looked. If you could see pictures of me at that point in time, I had an afro about this high, hair all over my face. I didn't care about my appearance. I didn't care about life. As far as I was concerned, if I had went to sleep one night and didn't wake up, it'd be no big deal because I felt like a failure. I failed in my relationship with my father. I failed in my relationships with my girlfriend. I failed at school. Now I'm subject to be nothing. I'm subject to work at McDonald's for the rest of my life and be a failure. So I was hunting uh, sexual pleasure with the girls that I worked with. Um, I started having relationships with many of them and not relationships as boyfriend, girlfriend, sex. That's all it was. I was not concerned about them. I, I became cold. My heart became callous because I didn't I didn't care anymore I felt like I had been hurt so many times that I now was on a rampage to hurt other people and women were most likely most time uh, the avenue in which I used to hurt people I hurt the women I was with uh, the devil knew what he was doing he knew that if he could destroy my life and take my life away from me at that time that I would be eternally lost but thank God that there is hope in our lives and that God stepped in and caused the events in my life to turn around. What ended up happening was I found out that there was a school, a self-supporting school in Arkansas. It was a Bible college that if I was willing to go, all I would have to do would be was to be willing to do do work and I would be able to pay for my tuition basically from doing door-to-door -door book sales we sold religious books and so I took the opportunity and I went um, and I went there and I really felt like God I'm gonna give you my life this time I'm gonna do it right I'm gonna make sure that I strive for that perfection that you said that we could have and I tried I really did but there was still something missing I where at first I was not encouraged at all to serve God there, later, I became encouraged only to do something 
for God. I was not concerned in giving my heart to God. I was concerned only doing a work for Him. Lord, okay, I'm going to be this great preacher for you. I'm going to be this great teacher. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And God was like, yeah, that's good. Those are good ideas to have. But do you know me? And the answer to that question was no. So I went to this school not knowing God. And not even two semesters later, I found myself back out of school. Uh, a second failure now with school. I did not finish there. And you know, whenever we fail at something, the devil has a way of whispering into our ears how filthy we are, how undeserving we are, how bad we are, how stupid we are. And if we are not close to God, we will receive these whispers, these thoughts that he injects into our minds, and it will affect how we live. And it began another dark stage in my life. I ended up getting mixed in with marijuana. And oh man, this, this, this really took my life for a spin. The devil and his, his temptations are like getting into a fast car where the driver is intoxicated. What do I mean? A fast car is already dangerous, meaning that it can be driven at high speeds. And if you're not trained to drive that car at high speeds, and even if you're trained, you can get hurt. But then adding that to an individual behind the wheel that's drunk, that's double trouble. And the devil knew that this marijuana habit that I began to cultivate would be that double trouble in my life because it became my life. It started to control me. If I couldn't get high, I didn't want to do anything. If I couldn't get high, I didn't want to go to work. If I couldn't get high, I didn't want to sleep. If I couldn't get high, I didn't want to do anything. And it just became a crutch in my life. And it was something that was so that it was so dominant of a force in my life uh, that I ended up growing and cultivating my own marijuana so that I wouldn't have to buy it and have to go and look for others to supply it for me. And as a result of that, uh, growing it, I got busted. I went to jail in the year 2007. I'm skipping over some things here. Um, you know, I ended up going to jail and uh, that really, you know, although I went to jail, when I got out, you know, it really wasn't like, yeah, I need to get my life together because, like I said, I didn't care about God. My whole objective in life was for pleasure. That's it. If I could pleasure my flesh, if I could smoke my blunt, if I could drink my liquor, if I could do whatever it was that made me feel good, then I would be fine. And that was really the pursuit of my life up to that point. What changed me? All of these things that I've shared in my life and, and, and and the negative relationships and the drugs and the alcohol and the sex, what was it that came into my life and finally changed me around? In the year 2007, I had an experience. One night, a friend and I were smoking some weed, me, him, and his girlfriend. We were in my apartment. And we were playing video games at the time as well. I remember feeling like a dark presence coming over me, but it wasn't mental, it was physical. Like I could feel something breathing on me heavily. And I looked at my friend and his girlfriend, I'm like, man, do y'all feel that? And they were playing the video game, they were having a good time. They didn't feel anything different. But for some reason, I just kept feeling like it was almost as if someone was strapping a straight jacket onto my chest and just getting it tighter and tighter. And I mean, it got so comfortable, I eventually asked them to leave, if I remember correctly, because I just, I needed to get away from what I was doing. I needed to put out the blunt, I needed to turn the video game off and figure out what was going on. I, I, maybe I thought that it was my health, maybe uh, my heart was beating too fast because of the drugs or whatever, I don't know. I just didn't, I didn't feel comfortable. I remember getting up and jumping in the shower, feeling like I could wash the feeling off, and it was just even stronger. Um, it, it wouldn't go away and I remember just feeling so down and like oh man you know th th this is not good and it felt almost like all of a sudden the Lord placed before me my life history and what would happen to me if I continued on the path that I was now on because remember if God has a plan for your life which he does for everyone you cannot go but, or you can only go but so far before he stops you in your tracks and lets you know that, hey, look, it's time for you to start working and living for me. 
and this was this particular incident. God was allowing me to see what was taking place in my life before and where I would go had I kept going down that path. And that really sobered me. You know, it really caused me to stop and think because a lot of times in life, we get so tangled up in the day-to-day -day things that we're doing. Uh, we get so mixed up into the matrix of this world that we don't stop and think about life and the decisions that we are making from moment to moment and how they affect us from moment to moment. We don't stop to think about those things. We're so concerned with pleasure. You know, the Bible says that there is a way that seems right unto a man. But the ends of those decisions, the ends of those thoughts is eternal death. Is what the Bible says. And this is true because, I mean, how many of you out there listening can relate to the fact that when you design to do something with yourself, nothing, you will allow nothing to stop you, whether it's good or bad. If you are going to become the world's biggest dope head, then you're going to do that. Or if you're going to become the world's greatest businessman, if you're focused and you know that this is really what you want to do, that's what you're going to do. That's what you're going to put your mind and your focus, your attentions on. But we also have to know that no matter what uh, desire, no matter what aspirations that we may have for ourselves, if we don't add God to that, then it's going to fail somewhere along the line. No matter how successful we may get, no matter how close to the taste of success we may come, if God is not a part of it, we're going to fail somewhere. No, no, failure is not. You may get the money. You may get uh, riches. You may get the fame. So you're saying, well, okay, if I got money and fame, how can I fail? We fail in the fact that we forget to work on self. We forget to present ourselves to the Creator to have Him mend us. Because remember, we're all broken people. We're broken vessels. And the devil loves to, to toy with our minds. He loves to toy with our emotion because eventually he wants to break us. He wants to destroy us. And so we come many times to the realization that we are broken but yet rather than go to the Creator to have ourselves fixed we stay where we are and we end up becoming even more destroyed and this was me you know the whole story that I've shared with you these few moments has really just been a story of complete darkness because until Christ came into the picture there was no light uh, my heart was hardened by sin the things that the devil placed in my path to trip me up, the pornography, the drugs, the alcohol, the women, all of these things, yeah, they may feel good for a moment. But when the party's over and the friends are gone and the people that you smoked with and drank with and had sex with and went to their respective homes, you're left by yourself in perfect silence. And it's still the issues that you have before are still there with you now. No matter what kind of joy you may felt during the time of the music and the dancing and the partying and the drinking, yeah, that stuff may feel good. You may feel like, yeah, you know, this is the kind of life I want to live for the rest of my life. But you know when those times come when you're by yourself and that high or that drunk feeling is just starting to come down and you realize that no one else is around and your conscience starts playing on you and you realize that I am far away from my Creator. I am far away from God. And when that time comes, what do we do? Rather than run to God and say, Lord, take me as I am. Remember the story of the prodigal son. He thought that, well, my, my father's not going to take me back as a son, so I'm just going to ask him if he'd take me back as a slave, as a servant. No. Jesus says, look, come to me, all you that labor that are heavy laden. What are we laboring with? What is, what is this burden that's on us? It's sin. How many times have you rolled that joint, rolled that blunt? How many times have you picked up that bottle? How many times have you called that woman or that man that you've had sex relationships with knowing that that thing is not going to bring you complete lasting joy, but yet you do it anyway? How many times have you thought that? How many times have you said to yourself, you know what, I need to stop this? But you couldn't. Why? Because you were under possession. The devil now has you tied to his train of sin and you cannot break free of it of yourself. That is when we have to come to the realization that we are weak, that we have no power and we have no strength, but that there is a God in heaven that will do all within his power to save us. 
That's when we need to come to the point where we fall on our knees and cry out to God, Lord, save me, because I'm drowning out here. The devil has so many things out there for me that's enticing to my flesh that if I keep doing it, I know I'm going to end up dead. And I'm going to end up lost and eternally separated. We know these things. And for those of you that don't know, that might be watching this, believe me. The reason why you don't feel complete satisfaction after you do something is because most times that thing you did has no eternal value. It has nothing within it that's going to elevate you. It has nothing within it that's going to propel you and carry you on to the next moment. Think about it. Think about it now. When the money's gone, the money that we spent on that fast car, we are so encouraged or so enthused to go out and get more money because, hey, that car alone by itself is not going to make us happy. Yeah, it might be beautiful, it might be fast, it might be luxurious, but we need more. We go out and accumulate more. But the more we get, if we don't get God, we still have nothing. My life was one of frustration. It was one of pain. It was not until I realized that I needed to get to know Jesus that things began to change for me. When I decided that it was time to seek my Savior, then things changed. And no, I am not able to bring myself to Jesus. You watching this video are not able to bring yourself to Christ. All we can do is cry out for help and Christ and His power will reach out beyond heaven to this earth and snatch us up and do for us what we could not do for ourselves. In the story of the prodigal son, it said that while the son was afar off, the father ran out and met him where he was. That means that the father was waiting and anticipating for this son to come, excuse me, to come back home. And he ran out there to grab him and bring him back because he loved him that much. When you realize that Jesus loves you, you realize that no matter what it was that you went through, it really doesn't matter. You're still living. You still have breath in your lungs. You still have blood in your veins. God in His mercy brought you through those dark stages. And yes, you may have mental scars. Yes, you may have wounds. Yes, you may be emotionally mixed up as a result of some of the things that you went through. But does that mean there's no hope? Definitely not. Jesus came to this earth to save people just like that. He didn't come to this earth to save the righteous, the perfect people, because they were already good. He didn't have to do a work for them necessarily. No, there's no one good within and of themselves. But Jesus is especially concerned. He is especially close to the ones out there that find themselves covered in darkness. Darkness meaning negative habits, negative thoughts, emotional and physical strain as a result of the lifestyle that we've lived and the things that we've done. God is particularly close to us. So this means this, that no matter what we've been through, now is the time if we hear God's voice calling us and telling us to come home and to dwell with Him and to give our hearts to Him, now is the time to do that. And all of this, all this requires is us admitting our condition. We are sinful, admit that. Yes, we love sin, we like to do things that we know is not good. But like I said, we know also that after we do these things that it leaves us empty. Admit that to God. Admit that you cannot help yourself. Admit that you want God to come and do something for you that you cannot do for yourself. And brothers and sisters, believe me, as I am sitting here before you today, I have not smoked and I don't desire to smoke. I no longer drink. I don't desire to drink. I don't I don't solicit sexual relationships outside the one with, that I have with my wife because I don't desire those things. Why? Is it because I'm good and perfect? No, no. Outside of God, I'll be doing the same things I used to. The only difference in me now is that I've allowed God to take over my life. I prayed, Lord, take my life. And I pray this prayer daily. Decide for me, Jesus, what you want me to do. And as a result of bringing 
myself or coming to the realization in my mind that I needed some help from an outside force, Christ has now come, able to help me. Well, this is my testimony. I praise God that the Lord has brought me from a very long way. If you've been struggling with any of the things that I've mentioned before, just remember that God is able to deliver you. All you need to do is admit your current condition, pray and ask for help, and watch how things turn around for you.